Hello, my name's Philip Dawson, and I'd like to talk with you about assessing learning. How do we know if people know stuff? So in this particular video, we'll talk about what the role of assessment is in higher education, talk about how we can specify it, certify learning outcomes, plagiarism, and we'll talk about curve versus criterion referenced assessment and if they're even compatible with each other. So when we talk about assessment, why do we have assessment? What role does it play? Well, we like to think we have formative assessment for learning. So a student submits a task that's you know, low stakes, maybe some sort of a worksheet in a tutorial, they get some feedback, they improve, we have this developmental or formative aspect. But we also have summative assessment for certification. So to be able to formally say someone knows something is to summatively certify them. Assessment can be a catalyst for learning. You remember that, that essay that you took one day that led you onto this amazing topic that might have become your life's passion for learning. The thing you still care so much about was in that essay topic or solving that problem or doing that experiment. It can be this catalyst to make you learn stuff. It can also be a gatekeeper for higher learning. If you hadn't have done that essay, maybe you wouldn't have passed the unit. Maybe you mightn't have been able to progress on to later subjects. Or maybe you wouldn't have had the requisite knowledge because you hadn't been forced to do it through assessment. Assessment can communicate the actual curriculum. Uh, we have this notion that assessment always defines the, the actual curriculum from the student's perspective, that they'll only do stuff that we assess, that they'll be pretty smart to figure out what is and is not really valuable because it's assessed or not. And assessment also communicates the discipline's values. <clears throat> I did my undergraduate degree in computer science. I can tell you two things that really matter to computer scientists from, from my experience. Um, one is that you document things well. Uh, that if you're writing computer software that it is either intrinsically documented because it just sort of makes sense or that you put documentation and little notes inside it. I know the discipline values this because assessment taught me that. If I didn't do this, I would get bad marks in the assessment. I also gather that computer scientists like things to be written concisely and precisely. When I ventured off into the discipline of education where I'm currently situated, I found that my old discipline's values around writing were not shared by the discipline of education. No offence to any educationalist watching this. So assessment always performs double duty. It always does a mix of those things on that slide. To consider assessment only as a summative certifying tool is to take a very narrow view of assessment. It's potentially to ignore some of the other things that are at play, whether we accept it or not. So the students are learning the values of your discipline through your assessment, whether you believe it or not. If you think assessment is only for certifying if they know stuff, you are still communicating the actual curriculum to them. You're still doing a whole bunch of things at the same time. So I'd like you to consider in the subjects that you teach that assessment is always doing many things at once beyond what we might think it does. And Within that framing, I guess this video has an incomplete understanding of assessment. This video focuses solely on that certifying sort of role of assessment, the does the student know stuff sort of role, rather than assessment as a catalyst for learning or anything like that. So we focus on designing and specifying, certifying, curve marking versus criterion reference marking and plagiarism, those sort of things. In another video, I talk about assessment as learning. Uh, so I talk about tasks that make learning happen, formative versus summative assessment, rubrics, peer and self-assessment and sustainable assessment. So I'm just flagging to you that in this video, we're going to focus on the summative and certifying role of assessment. But as Baud says, assessment always performs double duty. And I guess the other way to frame this is about, well, what does the research on assessment practice in higher education say? 
and this is from the ALTC Assessment Futures Project, which for me is probably the best concise description of current assessment practice and you know, sort of what we could do in assessment in the future. Um, the other good thing about this project is it focuses on stuff that you can do without taking up your whole life, so practical, time efficient stuff. So it was informed by research. What did they find the research said? Research on assessment practice in higher education is limited and is often generated by a local problem or situation. So I write a journal article about the assessment in a subject that I taught. Um, kind of limited, kind of localised. Rarely tracks a major intervention or brings together different studies of the same thing. So we tend to get these single studies that look at this thing I tried in my unit and it worked or didn't work and then I move on and don't talk about that again rather than sort of major whole of institution initiatives or whole of discipline initiatives or things taken on by a uh, professional body like the Institute of Engineers. And the research tends to be suggestive and ambiguous. Implications are not easily drawn from it. So I guess let's go into a discussion about assessment knowing that the research is suboptimal. So we often get to a discussion of assessment through questions like this. You know, how do we know who worked hard or who paid attention or who is smart? And we sometimes have this as our sort of role of assessment. So who are the people who really tried hard in their assessment and let's reward that? Who are the people who paid attention and picked up on that little odd fact that I said once in one lecture and, and remembered it in the exam? Or who are the people who are just naturally smart because they should be the ones that get the best marks, yeah? I'm going to say we should be thinking about this question. How do we know if they've achieved our learning outcomes? And I actually think learning outcomes should be the thing we frame our assessment around rather than notions of hard work, paying attention or being smart. Because at the end of one of our units, we say, you know this stuff, don't you? And working hard, paying attention or being smart is not actually an indication that you know these particular things. However, meeting my learning outcomes is an indicator that you know these things that the unit's supposed to be about. So we're going to focus on this. And I suggest if your assessment focuses on hard work, paying attention or being smart, that you might want to rethink that or change your learning outcomes to be at, this, at the end of this unit, you'll know how to work hard, pay attention and be smart. So how do we know if different sorts of learning outcomes are met? And we go again to this diagram of the solo taxonomy. Obviously, we're going to do different sorts of certifying assessment to assess a unistructural assessment from an extended abstract assessment, from a multistructural to a relational. And within these, a problem solving assessment is going to be different to a creative assessment. A list all of the bits in this system sort of assessment is going to be different to the extended essay. And they're different because they assess different sorts of learning outcomes. So I would like you to think about your assessment again in terms of am I doing tasks that match the learning outcomes or just tasks that match the sort of broad content areas. And I would also argue to you that one of our most assessed learning outcomes is the student's ability to read our assignment specifications. I've put that in quotes, that's just that's me, not written anywhere fancy, just in these slides. If you think about how you got into a position of teaching other people, it's, it's because you're smart at something, yeah. But it's also because you've been able to demonstrate you are smart at something over the years. You've been able to show that in a way that really matters to people. You've been able to interpret the specifications of assessment tasks. In one of my fields of research, which is peer learning, there's a slightly scary emerging small body of research that suggests that peer learning initiatives help people because they help them decipher the nature of the task, not because they help people learn stuff. Uh, I will tell you that's a minority sort of view in the, the peer learning research space, but if we can help people to achieve better in our classes just by having them figure out what our task is, perhaps our task might be too complexly specified. 
So how do we design and specify assessment? Well, we link outcomes to assessment components. This piece of this assessment relates to this learning outcome that we have. You might have more finely grained learning outcomes than the three to five that you say is your whole unit. But we want to communicate that by doing this thing, you will show us that you can do this thing. Remove busy work. So when I'm talking busy work, do you have arduous formatting requirements for your task that aren't really of any, any benefit to anyone? And they're just a way to sort of take off a few marks when someone stuffs up. If you do, that could be busy work. However, if formatting your work in this particular way or using this particular software package to do your, um, your presentation rather than using Microsoft Office really matters, if that's something that's important to your discipline, then sure, keep it. But be upfront that this is why we get you to format like this. Things like referencing are not busy work, but the degree of emphasis that you place on getting it exactly right might venture onto busy work territory. It's up to you. You know your discipline. You know what really matters in meeting your learning outcomes versus what's sort of there to bulk out the task or give us an easy way to take marks away from people. So find the busy work and eliminate it. And get your students to also identify when they think something is busy work rather than an actual opportunity for demonstrating what they know. Specify transparently, so use language your students understand. This will depend on who your students are. Give rubrics, give, give templates, give examples. Show them what it is that you want. You're not giving the game away by giving an example. Um, if you are, then perhaps your task might be mm, something with a Googleable solution. Yeah, something that if I were to find a solution to a similar problem online, I could probably just copy and I'd be done. That's, that's possibly a bad task. Find ways to show people the structure that you expect them to do. Rubrics, templates and examples take some of the busy work out of understanding the task and let students focus on showing you what they need to do, showing you what they know. When I talk about busy work here and, and templates, I guess something to be clear about is there are some disciplines where taking a poorly expressed or unclear problem and turning that into a solution is actually a, a legitimate thing we expect people to do in that discipline. Uh, I, I'm thinking back again to my own computer science days. Part of the sort of process of analysis of a problem is leading to the outcomes that we want from students. So I wouldn't consider that busy work. So it's a kind of complex changing topic that you, with your disciplinary expertise, are best placed to use elimination of busy work using templates, using examples, giving rubrics. Tell students why this particular task matters, why this piece of this task matters, how this is going to help them in the future, how this will help them do other things in this unit, and build some sort of a story or learning arc. These three tasks in this particular unit build upon each other. So we're giving you feedback as we go, and at the end you can do this amazing thing. Examine your assessments with some sort of a, a framework could be like this could be one you find elsewhere but I'd like you to specifically think do I have busy work in my assessments and do students know why the task matters okay we have a lot of innovative new assessments um, I imagine we get students to like dance the topic or um, make a video wouldn't that be cool that be great or build a website even or um, oh. okay so so innovative assessment is not always better I'll focus in on making a video let's say you want students to research a particular topic in health sciences let's say it's about why people smoke great it could be a legitimate thing in some sort of a public health unit cool let's say the specific things you're wanting to understand if they know are around the social determinants of health. So how society and um, pe people's 
social environment contributes to their health and perhaps their decisions around things like smoking. Let's say that's what you want to evaluate. And you get students to make you a three minute video about that, where you previously had a 2000 word essay. Which form is going to take more time from the students? If anyone, if you've ever done video production before, you might guess it's the video. Which form is going to show you how deeply they understand the content? And which form is going to take you more time or less time to mark? These are complex issues. When you're considering innovative or new forms of assessment, think about how they assess your learning outcomes. That said, if one of your learning outcomes is the ability to express the social determinants of health in ways that are understandable to um, the everyday public or something like that, then perhaps a YouTube video would be great for that. But if your outcomes are more around a deep understanding of the concept, I would argue that the three minute YouTube video is not going to demonstrate that. It's also a lot of work from the students for what might amount to busy work. It's also a, a different sort of work for you. Okay, would you be willing to sign this statement for your unit? That all learning outcomes in this unit are taught and assessed. I certify that any student who successfully completes this unit has achieved all of its learning outcomes. Now, I actually don't think I've ever been in a situation where I could sign off on that. I, I know I've taken units before as a student where I've managed to pass and there are whole learning outcomes that I have not met. I know there are times when as a teacher I've kind of glossed over some of the learning outcomes or designed assessments such that it was possible to get through the unit without really understanding topic X. Or perhaps there's a 100% exam or a 70% exam that really determines if you pass. And you can probably pass by being awesome at part A and terrible at part B. I'd like you to think about this and then ask yourself, does this matter? Does this matter that students pass my unit without understanding this thing that my learning outcomes say they will understand? Okay. A big debate in higher ed faculty education committees and the like is between these two concepts. Here we have a curve, we have a nice normal distribution, blah, blah. You know, we have this idea that 68% of students are going to fit within one standard deviation of the mean and then within two standard deviations of the mean we have another percentage and, and blah, blah. In some education contexts, you have to provide a nice spread of marks. However, you often are simultaneously signed up to a statement in your learning outcomes. On completion of this unit, you will be able to. These two ideas are incompatible. I argue to you that criterion referenced assessment and curve based assessment are incompatible. If you have average students, you have a difficult class with really difficult outcomes to meet, you do awesome teaching, all of your students meet those outcomes tremendously well, why don't they all get HDs? Why do you get in trouble if they all get HDs? However, if you go to the flip side and you have that same group of you know everyday students, hard outcomes, good teaching, and they don't meet those outcomes. Shouldn't they all get lower marks? Shouldn't really no one get a HD? I'm arguing to you that we can't have it both ways. If your faculty says that they do criterion referenced assessment, that they care about learning outcomes, that they care about rubrics that show you've met those learning outcomes, then you can't at the same time try and make everything fit the curve. They're incompatible ideas and I'm happy to have a discussion with you about this and point you towards more resources that can help back you up in arguing this point if you agree with me. If you disagree, I'd really love to have a chat with you about how we can reconcile these ideas as well. 
Okay, we'll finish off with a talk about plagiarism because in certifying learning, plagiarism is a, a really scary thing because we say a student knows X, but the students just copied their understanding of X from somewhere else. So why do students plagiarise? And this is data driven by um, a research study by Devlin and Gray. I'd like you to read those pages that I have there because we very rarely actually get out and talk to students and find out why they plagiarise. We have a lot of rhetoric about plagiarism, but it's not driven by the, the source. So students plagiarise because of inadequate admission criteria. You get into a course and you weren't prepared. What do you do? You don't want to fail. Dot, dot, dot. Poor understanding of plagiarism. If I don't know exactly what plagiarism is, how can I avoid it? Um, you know, the classic thing is we, we have this understanding of not copy-pasting, that copy-paste is plagiarism. However, you can talk to people, even some academics, who have a poor understanding about plagiarising ideas. If we don't uniformly understand that if I pinch your idea, rephrase it, put it in my own work, don't attribute it to you, if we don't all accept that that is plagiarism, then how do we expect our students to? Poor academic skills. If I lack the ability to reference, if I lack the ability to show you when I'm using someone else's ideas, then I'm probably going to end up plagiarising. We've all had that student who gives you the reference list at the end of the task, doesn't use those references anywhere else. And we've probably had that discussion with them where we say, well, that's actually not good enough. You need to use these references here when you use the ideas from them, and this is how you do it. That discussion is one of the best ways to help our students not plagiarise. Teaching and learning issues. We might design tasks which are too hard, which are very easily plagiarisable, which sort of promote plagiarism. There is the laziness or convenience argument. Imagine if I could plagiarise and not get caught and get that MBA or Bachelor of Computer Science or whatever, and no one will ever know that I plagiarised. Well, that's the easy option. It's convenient. There are people I can go and pay to write my computer programming assignments for me, and they work for incredibly cheap. I could go and work in a shop for five hours and pay someone to do the assignment that would have taken me 20 hours, isn't that the more convenient option? There's this weird one of pride in plagiarism. I can do it. I can beat the system. I'm smarter than the system. Pressures. Well, I, I really do need to succeed. Um, my family put a lot of money up for me to come over here and study. Um, it, it's actually going to be a really big deal if I don't pass. The consequences of not passing are too huge. Or pressures like, I don't have the time to actually do the non-plagiarising version of the assignment. And yeah, again, the cost of education. Sorry, I mixed that up with pressures there, but we can see their related education costs. Uh, family supporting you, you want to do your best. So I ask you to read those, pa those pages of the Devlin and Gray article and think to yourself, why do students plagiarise in my units and what can I do to try and help them not plagiarise? Thanks a lot.